And I think you'll, uh, you'll agree after you've heard what she's said. And we have, uh, we have Craig. Now, I don't know, well, he's not here yet, but l let's hope he turns up. I don't know if anybody remembers the, the, the diplomat who was, uh, who was sacked by Jack Straw for speaking out in Uzbekistan against the Uzbek uh, uh, abuse of human rights in the name of the war on terror. Uh, he's going he's, he's gonna to be arriving, I hope, in the next few minutes, and he'll be talking about the war on terror and how it's been abused uh, uh, by, by this government. He's actually going to be standing against Jack Straw in the general election. Yay. And we have a situation where we're moving away from... Um, away fr where, where we need to be moving away from domination uh, towards more cooperation. And this is, um, <clears throat> this is a policy that this party has recently passed around five particular principles. I won't go into those five principles because I'll tell you more about them after the speakers have spoken. Um, but it looks like Craig's arrived, so that's great. I, I, I won't ask him to speak first um, because he's only just arrived, but perhaps if I hand over to Ed first, is that okay? They're all going to be surprised because I haven't gone over the running order with them before this. We believe that creating a Ministry for Peace will be one step towards ensuring that non-violence and civilization win. And we call on your support to help make this happen. Thank you for listening. Craig Murray for you next. Uh, now, uh, as I said before, Craig, uh, Craig used to be a diplomat in Uzbekistan, um, but uh, uh, hit the headlines uh, a couple of months ago. Was it three, three four months ago? Oh, it feels like that. And, uh, and is now standing in the general election against Jack Straw to highlight the way in which the war on terror and other policies have uh, been undermining human rights. Craig. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I arrived slightly late. I just came down from Blackburn uh, by train. I um, never learnt to drive. I always used public transport or cycle or walk which is actually for environmental reasons, but something I usually play down. In fact, a journalist in Blackburn two days ago asked me why I never learned to drive, and I told him that since the age of 17 I had never been sober. <laughs> <laughs> which is also probably a little bit true. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about foreign policy ethics in foreign policy and try and relate that to some of the larger environmental questions. I'm, you will forgive me if I start from the particular and go to the general because I want to start with some of the things I encountered when I was British ambassador in Uzbekistan and in a way take you along the mental journey that that led me on. I'd been in the Foreign Office for 20 years when I was appointed to Tashkent. It was my first ambassadorial post. I was, in our, I was Deputy High Commissioner in Ghana, and the telephone went, was Foreign Office, would I go be ambassador in Tashkent? I said, certainly. And I put down the phone, and I went rushing out to buy an atlas to uh, <laughs> see where it was. I'd actually just agreed to go. Um, Tashkent was a bit of a shock. It's a wonderful place, in theory. It contain, Uzbekistan has a population of about 25 million people. It's a former Soviet republic. It contains places like Samarkand, Bukhara, Kiva, Tashkent. Mm -hmm. And it's a region which has a place in the British poetic imagination, has done for a while. But now it groans under one of the most brutal dictatorships on earth. It, the leadership is still precisely the same leadership that was in power in the Uzbek Socialist Republic in the days of the Soviet Union. And the power structures are essentially unchanged, except they've become more vicious. There was actually, I know it's hard to believe, but there was a certain element of restraint provided in the Soviet Union, which is, now, which is now gone. And 
most Uzbeks will tell you that they are now certainly a lot less D than they were under Gorbachev, substantially less D than they were under Brezhnev, but probably a little bit better off than they were under Stalin. There are approximately 10,000 people in the country, I, I, I would estimate maybe near the 12, um, who would be classified as political or religious prisoners. Um, of those, um, quite a number are um, ethnic Russians, journalists, writers, political dissidents. And that's not counting. They still maintain the practice of locking dissidents up in asylums, of lobotomizing them, of chemically lobotomizing them. The, but the majority of those 10,000, probably eight or 9,000, are prisoners for reasons of religion. Most of them are Muslims, though there are also a large number of Baptists and a smattering of, of Jehovah's Witnesses in the jails. Torture is extremely prevalent. It would be unusual for someone not to be tortured. Torture is applied in about 90% of these cases. The conviction rate in Uzbek prisons, in Uzbek courts, is over 99% be they political trials, be they ordinary criminal trials, over 99% result in a verdict of guilty. And almost always, that's because the prisoner has confessed to whatever they were accused of doing. Trials virtually always depend upon a confession. And the reason that over 90% of all people who are arrested confess is that they are simply tortured. They are beaten, they are raped, they see their children raped in front of them, they have electrodes applied to their genitals. One favorite method is to put a gas mask on someone and stop up the vents in order to cause suffocation. They use that method because it doesn't use any, leave any marks on the body if a person dies. And this is absolutely routine. In November 2002, um, Theo van Boven, the United Nations Special Rapporteur um, on torture, came out to Uzbekistan. You can find his report on the web. It was published by the United Nations. And he said that the practice of torture in Uzbekistan is widespread and systemic throughout the security services and police and courts which is true. There's no freedom of the media, no freedom of, absolutely no freedom of the media. The media is 100% government controlled. There's very little, the, unless you've experienced an extremely efficient totalitarian state, because that's what it is, it's hard to describe it to you. One image which is worth remembering is that Tashkent is a city of over two million people. It doesn't have a bookshop. There is no bookshop in a city of two million people. There are very, very few books around. There's no freedom whatsoever. On the 26th of December, they had an election in Uzbekistan. Uh, there were five political parties standing, all of which had the president as the president of their political party and all of which support the president. There are some genuine opposition movements. They were not allowed to register, not allowed to compete in the elections, and of course most of their leadership is either in exile or in prison. But they did attempt to register, but were not allowed to do so. Now it's very interesting, that election took place on the same day as the Ukrainian election and another former Soviet Union republic. Now you'll recall the Americans kicking up a huge fuss about the Ukraine, about their man having to win for democracy to be uh, in force. At the same, the same day, there was a completely fake election in Uzbekistan, and the Americans said nothing about it whatsoever. In fact, there was a two-paragraph speech that, by the American ambassador uh, that I've read, where he praised the Uzbek elections 
as a step on the road to democracy. And then, in a sentence at the very end, a single sentence said, it would have been better if the opposition had been allowed to take part. (laughs) And why? That's because Uzbekistan is a client state of the United States. It's quite hard to pin down precise figures because the Americans are very coy about it because most American aid to Uzbekistan comes from Pentagon budgets, not from State Department budgets. The kind of U.S. aid and State Department money to Uzbekistan is about $200 million a year. There's about another $300 million a year in military aid and security service aid. I was talking to a journalist from the New York Times who's been trying to piece together exactly what Uzbekistan does give. It's extremely difficult. In 2002, before there started to be political protests about it, the U.S. Embassy put out a press release in December 2002 saying U.S. aid to Uzbekistan tops $500 million in 2002. Since then, they've been much more coy. They won't now come up with a global figure and say what they give. But it's about half a billion dollars a year. I was saying I was in Accra before I went to Uzbekistan. To give you a comparison, half a billion dollars a year, which the U.S. gives to Uzbekistan... That's more than the total they give to all of sub-Saharan Africa. That gives you some idea of the motivation behind the aid. Sorry, it's not true. All of sub-Saharan West Africa, which was the bit I was responsible for, which consists of about 18 very poor countries. They get between them less than the money that just goes to Uzbekistan. Donald Rumsfeld... Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice have all been to Uzbekistan and have all praised the regime. President Karimov, who must be certainly one of the most vicious dictators in the world, it's the only state in which I know that prisoners are boiled to death, for example. He has been a guest to tea with President Bush in the White House. And the reason is that Uzbekistan is absolutely central to George Bush's idea of the new world order. In Uzbekistan, in Kashi, the United States has an air base in which they will tell you two squadrons of the United States Air Force are based. There's actually rather more there than they admit to, and there's several thousand troops guarding it. It's also a very, very large CIA presence cooperating with those security services who are torturing and killing people. And Donald Rumsfeld has this concept of what he calls lily pads, airfields surrounding what, again, the Pentagon calls the wider Middle East, which in effect is the Middle East as we understand it, reaching through through the Caucasus to Central Asia. They call that wider Middle East. And what they want is a series of air bases surrounding that whole region so they can project military force extremely quickly anywhere in that region. And the reason, of course, why the Middle East, the Caucasus, Central Asia is of such interest is hydrocarbons, oil and gas reserves. Uzbekistan is the biggest country in Central Asia. It borders all the other Central Asian countries. It has half the population of Central Asia. It has large gas reserves, though actually not nearly as much hydrocarbons as its smaller neighbours. But it's the dominant power, and from there you can threaten, cajole the other smaller Central Asian countries around. In this concept of lily pads surrounding the wider Middle East, that airbase at Kashi is fundamental to the American design. And when I tell you that it's less than one hour from Russian airspace, less than one hour from Chinese airspace, and less than 10 minutes from Iranian airspace, uh, you will understand why this is fundamental to American Pentagon strategy in looking at the next 50 years. And they're trying to consolidate this power base in 
Kashi in Uzbekistan. And that's the reason why they are backing this dictatorship. But the backing goes wider than that. I said they cooperate with the intelligence services. When these people are being tortured, they are made to sign up to stuff. Now, the Uzbeks, what they want them to sign up to is the notion that any opposition in Uzbekistan is linked to al-Qaeda. Uzbekistan, of course, borders Afghanistan. And if you torture someone past the limit of all endurance, they will sign up to anything. So you'll not be surprised to hear there is a stream of intelligence coming out of the Uzbek intelligence services talking of links to al-Qaeda and plots against the West because that's what the Uzbeks want us to believe in order that the Americans will continue to give them this tremendous level of aid and support. And I saw um, MI6 reports which had come initially from the Uzbek intelligence services talking of links between individuals in Uzbekistan and Osama bin Laden. And in many cases, I just knew from the facts on the ground and, and my own networks that it was just completely untrue. This was absolute nonsense. I complained like mad back to London that we were receiving this stuff. It was got under torture, and it was untrue. I was called back for the meeting in March the 8th, 2003, and was told that legally there was nothing in the UN Convention Against Torture that prevented us from obtaining and using intelligence material got under torture as long as we didn't do the torture ourselves or specifically ask for the individual to be tortured. And that was the government's legal advice. I asked for it in writing, and I was eventually given it in writing. But what sort of state do we live in where government lawyers are sitting devising ways around the UN Convention Against Torture so we can get material obtained under torture. And I said to them, well, that's immoral, whether it's illegal or not. I mean, I still believe it's illegal, but, whether, but it's certainly immoral, besides which the information just isn't true. And I was told by a representative of the security services, no, nope, we think this is high-grade intelligence material, which adds to our knowledge of Islamic terrorist activity against the West. And I said, but it's nonsense. It just doesn't fit the facts on the ground. They weren't interested. Now, of course, this was the same month that they were presenting the dossier on weapons of mass destruction, consisting of similar intelligence material on threats to the West, which also turned out to be a complete lack of complete lot of baloney, just an absolute fabrication, a dossier full of lies, and they're accepting the same sort of lies that exaggerate the threat from the Uzbek intelligence services. And if I'd been in Egypt, I would have seen it from the Egyptians. If I'd been in Saudi Arabia, I would have seen it from the Saudis. If I'd been in Syria, I would even see it from the Syrians, because they have intelligence cooperation with us. And these people want to accept material that exaggerates the threat because it justifies the budgets of MI6 and MI5 and the Ministry of Defence, and it helps keep the country in this state of fear where Tony Blair can stand up and say, we know that there are hundreds of people plotting to blow up London, therefore we need to have the ability to lock people up in the UK without trial and without saying why because of this terrible threat to our security. Well, it's based on, in many cases, a great deal of nonsense. And it is absolutely appalling, absolutely appalling, that the government is saying that you or I or any of us, but more likely um, some unfortunate member of the Muslim community in one of our towns, can be locked up, not told why you're locked up, not given access to lawyers, not allowed to see what you're charged with, not go to a judge, and they're saying it's on the basis of intelligence material. And they say that as though intelligence material is some extremely gold-plated, copper-bottomed, correct, can't-be-gainsaid piece of magic information the government have access to. Well, it's not true at all. A great deal of their intelligence material is very, very dodgy indeed, and certainly no foundation 
for locking anyone up, and it wouldn't last a moment in court, which is why they are desperate to have these powers to lock people up without having it tested in court. And finally, I think we have to look at why the United States is doing this. Now, I was sitting in this country in Uzbekistan, which, let's face it, no one's ever heard of. And because no one's ever heard of it, they can get away with all this support. If America, even in Ukraine or Belarus, for example, the Americans were supporting actively, massively, supporting a regime which tortures, kills, and imprisons its own people, there'd be a huge cry about it. Because it's in Central Asia, and no one's ever heard of a place, and it's too long a name, it doesn't reach the media, and there's no hue and cry about it at all. But I was in this place where the, the Americans, with Britain coming along saying, yes, me too, me too, were actively supporting this dreadful dictatorship. At the same time that we were claiming to be going to war with Iraq in order to remove a dictator. Now, how can it be our policy? I mean, George Bush saying it's American policy to oppose dictatorships. It's not. It's American policy to support dictatorships or remove dictatorships, depending on whether or not that facilitates America's access to hydrocarbon resources. And that's what US foreign policy is about. It is not at all, it is not at all about democracy. And why do they want to facilitate access to hydrocarbon resources? They want to facilitate access to hydrocarbon resources so they can get the damn things out as quickly as possible, guzzle them up, ruin the environment, and pollute the world. And but so you, this links in to their attitude to Kyoto. It's all about backing short-term economic interests by military force, by war, by backing unpleasant dictatorships, anything that will fuel the interests of the oil lobby. Now then... It is astonishing to me that under what's called a Labour government, we are going along with that agenda. And we have a foreign policy which seems to consist of nothing other than support for President Bush. And I must say, no one likes to like their job, but by God, I'm glad to be out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.